Well, today I'm going to talk on the topic of the six days. It's basically based on this book, Six Days, The Age of the Earth and the Decline of the Church. The six day issue is such an emotional issue with so many people, so many people in our churches, so many Christians that I meet. So many people say it doesn't matter whether you believe in six days or not, and then a lot of our Christian academics and pastors will say, well, you can believe in millions of years and it doesn't matter. And some people get very emotional about this, and they say, why, why do you even care about that? I mean, the most important thing is to go out and preach about the gospel. So we're going to talk about why it matters whether you believe in six days or not. And there are a number of books that I'm going to use material from, Six Days, this one, which is a much more detailed look and much more deeper theological look at this whole issue and a lot of the documentation they have in there. And then the research we've done. We did research on why millennials have left the church and very few return. In fact, two-thirds of young people walk away from the church by college age, very few return. And then ready to return, the millennials that are left in the church and what they actually believe or don't believe. And then this one, which is, I think, a very, very important book. I'd like to get, see it get a lot more traction. Already compromised, we actually had America's research group do research on Christian colleges, seminaries, Bible colleges. The, the more that you call mainline, more towards the conservative end of things in regard to their theology, and what they believe, particularly when it comes to Genesis, and the actual results were, were shocking. Uh, revealing, um, astounding. And so I'll mention those at various places. But the topic today is this, six days of creation, the age of the earth, does it really matter? Well, when we ask that question, does it really matter? I want to ask that question in a different way. Does it really matter if we take God at his word? Because that's the bottom line. That's what it comes down to. Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6, every word of God is pure and do not add to his words. I believe on this issue of the age of the earth, the six days of creation, reading the book of Genesis, that so many Christians, so many of our Christian leaders have actually added to the word of God. And I'm going to divide this into three main sections. Number one, it's an authority issue. Number two, it's an indirect salvation issue. And number three, it's a gospel issue. Now, I'm going to spend more on number one. It's an authority issue. It's an authority issue. And then we'll briefly look at number two and number three. You know, when secular media and secularists have come in the past to the Creation Museum and they want to interview our speakers or interview me, I find that they usually bring up the issue of the age of the earth uh, in a very scoffing way or why we believe in six days the age issue seems to be something they always come up with. It's interesting, I've noticed whenever articles are written about us in secular media and sometimes in some of the Christian media as well, it'll say, Answers in Genesis or the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum, Canham. These are the people that believe in six literal days and believe in a young earth and, and they reject millions of years. And of course, they claim we reject science, which we do not reject science. Secularists believe in millions of years, and they have to. Why is it such an emotional issue, the whole issue of the age of the earth? I mean, I've even seen programs on television with Richard Dawkins where if somebody disagrees with him about evolution, he will obviously say they're wrong and so on. But if you say the earth is only thousands of years old, he'll go ballistic. They, these secularists absolutely get emotional over this issue. But here's the point. They have to believe in millions of years. And why is that? Well, how do you explain a process that you don't see happening? You don't see molecules to man evolution happening. And it, it, it's impossible because we don't see any mechanism where matter produces new information to add in to, to the genes. Uh, in fact, we don't see any mechanism where you can produce DNA as an information system and code system, codes that come from intelligence, information from previously existing information. So how do you get people to believe an impossible process? Well, you have to propose an incomprehensible amount of time. None of us comprehend, comprehend millions of years. I mean, we, we even sort of get surprised when we think about, well, what was here a couple of hundred years ago in America? Or 300 years ago, 400 years ago? 
we, we, we don't realize, you know, what man can do in such a short amount of time. If we go back to 1954, George Wald was an American biochemist who received a Nobel Prize in 1967. And he said this, time is in fact the hero of the plot. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, the probable virtually, un the virtually certain. One has to only wait. Time itself performs the miracles. For, for the secularists, time is so important. You see, if they don't have the millions of years, I mean, we see changes in animals. Creationists have talked about natural selection, speciation. We see that occurring. What we don't see is one kind of animal changing into another. We don't see that. And so given enough time, all the billions of years, hundreds of millions of years, that's what the secularists are saying. Ah, but all this time, it happens. But if they don't have that time, let's say the universe, the Earth is only about 6,000 years old. If the secularists agreed that that was so and the millions of years wasn't true, then they've got a problem. How do they postulate their evolutionary ideas? They can't. That's why they get so emotional about this. They realize they have got to have the millions and billions of years. In fact, I find people like Richard Dawkins, other atheists, you know, if you don't believe in other aspects of their evolutionary processes, they'll groan and carry on and so on. But if you don't believe in the billions of years, then, then you'll be called anti-academic. You'll be called anti-scientific. You'll be called anti-intellectual because they will, they will be so emotional about this that they have to, they have to attack you and intimidate you. And that's what's happened. There's been incredible intimidation to believe in the millions and billions of years. There's academic intimidation, which is why so many of our Christian academics believe in millions and billions of years, to conform to what the world wants us to believe. You know, we make no apology about the fact that here at Answers in Genesis, at the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, we believe God created in six literal days as we read in Genesis, and we don't believe in the millions of years. We only believe in thousands of years. In fact, we would say the whole universe is only about 6,000 years old. Now, people will say to me, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't say the earth is 6,000 years old. It doesn't say the universe is 6,000 years old. You don't get 6,000 by just reading a verse in the Bible, and you don't. When people say to me, where does the Bible say that the universe is only, say, 6,000 years old? Well, it doesn't, and I'm glad it doesn't, <laughs> because if it did, it would mean the Bible would not be infallible. Why do I say that? Well, you know... God's written word was completed about 2,000 years ago. So if 2,000 years ago it said the universe was 6,000 years old, now it'll be 8,000 years old. See, but here's the thing. The Bible doesn't give a specific age for the universe or the earth, but it does, does give us a very specific history. It starts off by telling us God created in six days. Now, there's a big argument there where people say, well, those days could be long periods of time. They could be millions of years. We don't know what they are. I hear that sort of thing in the church all the time. Well, I'm going to say we do know what they are from the language in Scripture, but just, just humor me for a moment. Let's just assume that they are six ordinary days. Just let's assume that. Even if you don't believe that, let's just assume that. If they are six 24-hour days, then the Bible tells us that God made Adam on day six. And then it tells us that Adam had a son, Seth, at 130 years old, and Seth fathered Enosh at 105, Enosh fathered Kenan at 90, Kenan fathered um, Mahalalel, or however you pronounce it, at 70, and he fathered Jared at 65, and Jared fathered Enoch at 162, Enoch fathered Methuselah at 65, Methuselah fathered Lamech at 187, Lamech fathered Noah at 182, Noah fathered Ham, Shem, and Japheth at 500. In other words, there are specific ages given Specific ages when people were born, when they died, you have all those genealogies. And if you add them up in Scripture, when you get to Abraham and then to Christ and then to the present day, you come to about 6,000 years. That's where we get the 6,000 years from. And that history is very, very important because God's given us history. In fact, we have genealogies, a number of places in the Old Testament. The New Testament ones, by the way, are much more summarized. So don't just look at those. Look at the ones in Genesis 5, for instance, and others that we have in the Old Testament. But that history is there to show us that we all go back to Adam. We're all descendants of Adam. We're all one race. We're all sinners. 
and that God's son stepped into history to be a descendant of Adam and then died for the descendants of Adam, was raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. So this is very, very important for us to have that history. Now, that 6,000 years, though, as I said to you, assumes that the days of creation are ordinary 24-hour days. So what are those days of creation? I remember one lady at a church once, she was very emotional about it, and she says, I don't limit God to six days. I allow him millions of years. I'm not like you creationists. I don't limit him to six days like you do. And I said, ma'am, I don't limit God to six days. I limit myself to letting God tell me what he did. I don't tell God what he did, and it's about time you stop telling God what he did. And you know, I want, I want to bring that up to us. We need to let God tell us what he did. He tells us through his written word what he did in history. He's revealed to us through his written word. We read in the New Testament, we know what Jesus did concerning walking on water and, and healing the blind and the lame and raising the dead and so on and the teaching that he gave from this written word. Well, God has given us his written word from Genesis through uh, Revelation. And I, I had uh, one pastor once say to me, but you know what? The word for day and the Hebrew word for day is pronounced yom. It's a Hebrew word for day. He said, but the word yom uh, can mean something other than an ordinary day. And you know what my answer was? Of course it can mean something other than an ordinary day, but it can also mean an ordinary day. And I remember him saying, but it can, me but it can mean something other than an ordinary day. And I would say, but my point is, it can also mean an ordinary day. So it's not a matter of the word day can mean something other than an ordinary day. It's a matter of what does the word day mean right there in Genesis chapter 1. You see, most words have two or more meanings dependent upon context. I mean, think about it. If there were people in this auditorium, as we've had in the past, and we will in the future once we're allowed to open again, I could say, I see somebody who's at the back of the auditorium sitting in one of the chairs at the back with their back against the back of the chair, and maybe they have a sore back, and they came back after being here earlier. There's a word back having a number of different meanings. Well, most words have two or more meanings dependent upon context. You could tell what each of those those meanings were of the word back just from the context and the way I use that. Well, consider the word day. In English, it can have different meanings. Back in my father's day, there it means time. It took 10 days. When you say you take 10 days, you're really meaning 10 24-hour days. To drive across the Australian outback during the day. When you say during the day, you really mean the daylight portion of a day. So there's the word day in English having three different meanings. And the Hebrew word for day, the word yom, has a similar range of meanings as does the English word for day. For instance, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, as Americans say it, the day of the Lord. That's talking about time. The time's not talking about a 24-hour day. It's just saying the day of the Lord. Or in Judges, the day of the captivity of the land. Or in Genesis 2, verse 4, there it's talking about the day that God created. It's not talking about a specific day. It's just talking about the time that he created, referring back to the six days of creation. See, people often say, oh, how can the word day in Genesis 1 mean an ordinary day when it doesn't mean an ordinary day there in Genesis 2 verse 4? Well, it's the context. And that's what I want to show you. It's the context. The word day in the context, the way it's used there in the Hebrew language, it means time. You see, the word day is used 2,301 times in the Old Testament in single or plural form. You know what I find is interesting? We know what the word day means everywhere it's used in the Old Testament except Genesis chapter 1. Why is it always Genesis 1 that's the problem? I don't hear people arguing about what the word day means elsewhere in the Old Testament. I don't hear anyone saying how long did Joshua take to march around Jericho? Was it a million years? Was it 100,000 years? How long did he take? When it says he marched around in a day, we know what that means. It means it was an ordinary day. You see, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. When does the word yom, the Hebrew word for day, when does it mean an ordinary day? Because it can mean an ordinary day. In fact, that's its main meaning, is ordinary day. But it can mean time. It can have a number of different meanings. If you go to a well-respected Hebrew lexicon, a Hebrew dictionary, and you look up the meaning of the word day, you'll find lots of different meanings and the different contexts that are given 
But the examples of when uh, the word day means an ordinary day, well, the first examples there are given are Genesis chapter 1, verses 5, and then we go on uh, from there uh, to each of the other times for the six days. In other words, in this Brown Driver Briggs, very respected lexicon, uh, an example of when the word day means an ordinary day are the days of creation. Now, if you look at a more modern Hebrew dictionary, this Hebrew lexicon here by Kola Baumgartner, it actually goes through and gives you all the different times when day is used, but then it, 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 it lists the different meanings. But number two, it says day of 24 hours. That's pretty specific. The first example is Genesis 1.5. So there you have two respected Hebrew lexicons actually giving you examples of when the word day does mean an ordinary day and they have all sorts of other meanings for day listed there too but the examples of an ordinary day are the days of creation. And why is that so? Well if you ignore Genesis 1, just get rid of Genesis chapter 1. Whenever the word day is used with a number 410 times out of Gen outside of Genesis 1 it always means an ordinary day. Whenever you have the phrase evening and morning together without the word day, outside of Genesis 1, 38 times it always means an ordinary day. Whenever you have evening with day or morning with day, outside of Genesis 1, 23 times each in fact, always means an ordinary day. And whenever you have the word night with day, it means an ordinary day. In other words, if you ignore Genesis 1 in the rest of the Old Testament, whenever the word day is used in a number, whenever you have the phrase evening and morning, or you have the word evening with day or morning with day, or you have the, the word night with day, it always means in context an ordinary day. Now, if we know when day means an ordinary day, then... Why is it so difficult to understand Genesis chapter 1? It must be extremely muddled and, and not clear at all. Let's go and have a look. So for the first day, we have night, we have evening, we have morning, we have first or number, and we have day. So you've got night with day, you've got the phrase evening and morning, you've got evening with day, you've got morning with day, and you've got number with day. How can you come to any other conclusion that this is an ordinary day? In fact, look at each of the rest of them. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. It's almost as if God is saying, you know, these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick that I'm going to qualify the word day over and over and over again, but they're still not going to believe it because they don't believe my word and they don't want to believe my word. You know, if you go back to, for instance, Genesis 2, 4, in the day that the Lord created, there's no evening, no morning, no evening and morning, no number, there, the context means time. It's the same for judges, the day of the captivity of the Lord, or the, or the one from Isaiah that we used. But here in Genesis, here in Genesis, it is very different in Genesis chapter 1 because you've got evening and morning and number, and for the first day, you even have night uh, qualifying the word day. Now, let's go on. Where do we get the idea of the week from? Think about it. The rotation of the earth on its axis, that's one day. The relationship of the earth and the moon is a month. Uh, the earth and the sun, that's a year. Where does the seven-day week come from? Well, there's only one place. It doesn't come from any astronomical observations. It only comes from Scripture. Exodus 20, verse 11. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In other words, the seven-day week comes from the fact that God made everything in six days and rested for one. It wouldn't make sense that God made everything in millions of years and rested for millions of years. It doesn't, it doesn't fit at all with what Exodus uh, 20 is saying to us. In fact, really, God could have created everything in no time at all. I mean, he's God. Well, he could do it in a second. How come he strung it over six days? That seems like an awful long time for God to take to create everything. Six days, but he did it as a pattern for us. And Exodus tells us right there, the pattern of the seven-day week. But then there are people that say to me, now hang on a minute, you're saying there was day and night, day and night for each of the six days of creation, but if you take Genesis and read it just as written, the sun, moon, and stars weren't made until day four. So how can you have day and night without the sun? Well, here's the point. You don't need, you don't need the sun for day and night. 
What do you need for day and night? You need light and darkness. Do you have light and darkness on day one and day two and day three? Well, think about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be light. And he divided the light from the darkness. In other words, yes, there was light and there was darkness on day one. Now, people say to me, okay, where'd the light come from? Well, guess what? I don't know. God doesn't tell me. And I believe it was a created light because God said, let there be light. Some people say, well, God is light. Well, why would he say, let there be light? It's a created light. And it's interesting that he created the sun on day four to rule over the day that already existed, right? The sun and the moon to rule over the day and the night that already existed. And from that time onwards, they were to rule over the day and the night, the sun uh, and the moon. And you see, uh, when you look at that, uh, you, you could say to yourself, well, why would God do it that way? Why would he leave the sun until day four? It's interesting, down through the ages, many cultures have tended to worship the sun. You know what I think God is saying? The sun is my tool, right? I created the universe. I created space, time, and matter. I created the earth. I even created plants on day three. So you go through and see that. The sun is my tool. Don't worship the sun. The sun didn't give rise to the universe. God did. Worship the God who made the universe, who made light, and then made the sun to rule the day that he had already created. And this brings up another very important point too, because there are many Christians that have said to me, many Christian leaders have said to me, well, what's wrong with believing in the Big Bang? There are many you'll find in the church that say, well, surely in the beginning God created, bang, that's the Big Bang. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Big Bang idea is based on the religion of naturalism. It's based on the religion of atheism. The whole idea of the Big Bang was try to explain everything by natural processes without God. I mean, the whole idea of millions of years, really, in regard to the fossil record, came about in the 1700s and 1800s by those who wanted to explain everything by natural processes. Naturalism is a religion. Naturalism is the religion of atheism. Why would you want to take an idea based on atheism and then add that to the Bible? And besides this, when you look at the Big Bang model, which has all sorts of problems when you actually look at it from a scientific perspective, or well, that's not our purpose today, but when you take the Big Bang model, it has the stars coming before the sun and before the earth, which is said to be a hot molten blob that cooled down for millions of years before water, before liquid water on the earth. What does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us God made the earth first, before the stars, before the sun, and the earth wasn't a hot molten blob, it was covered with water. Read Genesis 1, read the first day of creation, and the Spirit of God hovered uh, above the waters, and the sun, moon, and stars were not made until day four after the earth. You can't add the Big Bang to the Bible. When you add the Big Bang to the Bible, it's the same as when you take evolutionary ideas in geology and biology and add them to the Bible. You're taking man's pagan religion of, ev of evolution, man's pagan religion to explain things by natural processes and trying to add it into God's word and changing the word of God. That's no different to what the Israelites did in the Old Testament where they adopted the pagan religion of the age, even child sacrifice and worship of idols and so on and they change the word of God. They undermine the authority of the word of God. And people, we have the same problem today. There's nothing new under the sun, and it permeates the church. It permeates the Christian world. We have forsaken the word of God. Um, we have put our trust in man instead of God. And over and over in Scripture, we're told, don't trust man. Put your trust and faith in God. Don't compromise the word of God. Of God. That's been a, a major factor in undermining biblical authority that has led to so many of the younger generations not believing God's word and have walked away from the church. But you know, then I get these people that say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. In fact, just recently on the 700 Club, uh, Pat Robinson was answering a question about the days of creation and then he believes in millions of years and he made a lot of statements that don't even make sense. But then he said, 
Ah, but the Bible says, this is the only passage he quoted from the Bible, didn't quote Genesis, but 2 Peter 3. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. As if to say, see, the word day, we don't know what it means, because here we're being told a day is like a thousand years, or a thousand years like a day. Wait a minute, that has nothing to do with the days of creation. You can't use a phrase from the New Testament to determine the meaning of a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word yom, in Genesis. A Hebrew word depends upon the Hebrew language and the context in which it's, it's written. A phrase from the New Testament doesn't ter- determine the meaning of a Hebrew word. But not only that, look at 2 Peter 3. What's the context of 2 Peter 3? The context is the second coming. Beware, in the last days, scoffers will come, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have done from the beginning of creation. And for this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens are of old and the earth uh, created out of water and so on. And they're willingly ignorant that the world that then was uh, overflowed with water and perished. That's a reference to the flood of Noah's day. And they're willing to ignorant that there's going to be coming judgment by fire. They say, God didn't create. God didn't send a flood. He's not going to come and judge by fire. Things just go on and on and on. I mean, that's what the evolutionists say, basically. You know, things just go on and on and on for millions of years. But for those that are saying, where is the promise he's coming? You know, we haven't, we haven't seen him come. You said he was coming back. We haven't seen that. Ah, but do not overlook this one fact. With the Lord, with the Lord, not with what man, notice. With the Lord, to God, a day is like a thousand years. And to God, a thousand years is like a day. Why? He's outside of time. He's not limited by natural processes and time. So to God, it doesn't matter whether it's a day or a thousand years. We are bound in time because we're created in time. God was not. He exists in eternity. And that's what this is saying. And you know, he tells us why he hasn't come uh, for, well, uh, since the first coming, when he came as a baby in a manger, and he hasn't come back in 2,000 years. It's not willing, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because he's a gracious God and a long-suffering God. So we think it's a long time, 2,000 years, but it's not a long time to God. It's no time to God because he is outside of time. That's what that verse is all about. And for someone like Pat Robinson to quote that in regard to the days of creation is just nonsense. It really is. It is nonsense. You know, it's interesting too, when people quote that passage that way, a day is like a thousand years, I notice something. They only apply it to the days of creation. Do you ever hear them saying, oh, Jonah must have been in the fish 3,000 years. After all, a day is like a thousand years. Of course not. You know, we, we will do anything but believe in the six literal days of creation. Why? Because we'll be intimidated by the world if we believe in six days in a young earth. Because they have to have their millions of years. You know, I like what Martin Luther wrote about this, the great reformer. In his day, he had a problem. There were church fathers uh, that said, uh, you know, <laughs> making, making God create in six days, well, wait a minute, he's the infinite creator God. Uh, no, he, he could have created in no time at all, you know. Uh, he, he could have created everything in one day. Well, here's what Moses said. When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, and let this period continue to have been six days, and don't, do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. It's interesting. In Martin Luther's day, there were church fathers that had the opposite problem to today. They were saying, no, God couldn't have done it in six days. He had to do it in a much shorter time. And today they're saying, no, God couldn't have done it in six days. He had to be millions of years. And the reason they say millions of years, you think about this. When people bring up millions of years or they bring up some of these positions like the gap theory and the day age theory and so on, you didn't get millions of years from the Bible. You've been influenced by outside of Scripture. Because that's where you got the millions of years from. You don't get it from Scripture. Then people say, okay, okay, so there's six days. Why does it even matter? I mean, why does it matter if the earth is millions of years old or if it's thousands of years old? It's got nothing to do with the gospel. It's just a side issue anyway. No, it's not. It's an authority issue. This is the absolute authority of the word of God. 
Would we say it doesn't really matter if you believe in the virgin birth? I mean, it's not tied to salvation. Does it really matter if you believe that Jesus walked on water? That's not tied to salvation. Does it really matter if you believe Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Nowhere does it say you have to believe that to, uh, to, to be saved. And you would say, yeah, but this is the word of God. You've got to take God's word as written. Well, that's my point. This is the word of God. And you see, there are people that say, but look, we've got all these moral issues in the culture. You know, gay marriage and abortion and pedophilia, the gender issues, euthanasia. Surely it's much more important to, to deal with those. Anyway, the most important thing is to go out and talk about the gospel. I've had pastors say to me, look, who cares whether it's six days? We just need to tell people about Jesus. Where's the message that Jesus comes from? comes from this book. If we have generations that have been told, you no need to believe this book here, and they start to doubt it and, and, and don't believe many other parts of it or, or, or a slippery side of belief through the whole book, they're not going to listen to what you say about the gospel. And look what's happened. There's been an incredible exodus from the church. The church is not impacting the culture like it used to. We know the church is in big trouble. I mean, in the Western world, from a human perspective, it's fighting for its very life. Now I know the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But when you look at it from a human perspective, what a mess in the church. Because we haven't stood on the word of God. And particularly in this era, in Genesis, we've given up biblical authority. And that has impacted the younger generations who see us not standing on God's word. Look, I was interviewed on a radio program once by a Presbyterian minister. And he said to me, now wait a minute. Look, you must agree that we can have as Christians, there's different denominations, you've got Baptist and Lutheran and Presbyterian and, and so it goes on. I mean, there's all sorts of different denominations. And there's different theological positions, aren't there? Well, yes. I mean, in eschatology, there's pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, windmill, treadmill. Actually, lots of different views of eschatology, that's true. Different views of modes of baptism, sprinkling, immersion, yeah. Different views about speaking in tongues, whether it's still a gift or it's not, yeah. Different views about the Sabbath day and so on. I said, yeah. And he said, we have different views about Genesis. It's the same thing. No, it's not. And if you can understand this, you'll get the point. And then I want to illustrate it by showing you the rampant compromise in our churches and Christian colleges. Look, when you're arguing about eschatological positions, modes of baptism, speaking in tongues, Sabbath day. Obviously, you know, not everyone's right, right? And God's going to sort us all out one day. But primarily, we're looking specifically at Scripture. What does the Scripture teach here? What does the Scripture teach here? What's it say here? Ah, yes, but over here it says this. And we're using Scripture, interpret Scripture. But we're arguing primarily from Scripture. But think about this. When it comes to Genesis and all the different positions in Genesis, day-age theory, gap theory, adding the millions of years into Scripture in, in some way, local, whatever, what's happening? People are saying, because of what the evolutionists say, because of the Big Bang, because of millions of years, we're taking these ideas outside of Scripture, going to Scripture, and we're trying to interpret Scripture in some way to fit with man's beliefs of the day. That's the difference, and that's what's happened, and that undermines the authority of Scripture. That's why this issue is such a massive issue. Because to add millions of years, to add man's ideas into the Bible is a direct attack on the authority of the Word of God. And that's why I've always said that the Answers in Genesis ministry is a biblical authority ministry. We're not just on about creation, evolution, and the age of the earth, and, and, and the days of creation. We're on about the authority of the word of God. And do we let God speak to us from his word, or are we imposing our ideas on scripture? You know, back in the 1700s and the 1800s, before that time, the majority of, of uh, church fathers and so on believed in six days and a young universe. But what happened was, there were those, particularly uh, atheists and deists in the 1700 and 1800, who popularized the idea that, oh, the fossil record took millions of years to get there before man. Uh, they wanted to explain everything by natural processes. Well, what happened was there were church leaders that said, oh, we'll take the millions of years and fit it into the Bible. You know, we'll, we'll fit it somewhere either before the first verse or we'll put it between verse 1 and verse 2 and uh, of Genesis 1 and embedded the gap theory or we'll reinterpret the days of creation in some way. But notice something, trying to fit something from outside the Bible into the Bible. That's why you have all these different approaches here. 
And then along came Darwin, who said, not only do you have the millions of years, but look at animals. We notice they change. And so one kind of animal changed into another over millions of years. And there are many in the church that said, oh, we'll take that and say God used evolution. And, and then Darwin popularized the idea that ape-like creatures uh, turned into people. Oh, we'll take that idea and say God evolved Adam and Eve. And so what you saw rise in history in the church were all these different positions, gap theory, day-age theory, theistic evolution. Then there were those that said, oh, we can take the Big Bang and add that into the Bible. And you can go and list all the compromised positions of Genesis 1. You'll find different colleges, Bible colleges, churches, church leaders, will, will have one of these sorts of positions. Gap theory, day-age, theistic evolution, day-gap day, framework hypothesis, progressive creation, Adam is a metaphor for Israel, cosmic temple inauguration view, humans from animals with amnesia. Yeah, these are all views you'll find in the church. And certain denominations tend to... Uh, take one view over the others more it depends on who was influential in that denomination in their colleges whoever to teach a particular view but you notice something every one of those views every single one of them has one thing in common you know what it is every one of them adding millions of years into the bible they're all attempts by man to somehow fit millions of years into the bible I go to churches sometimes and they say, oh, we have an elder who believes in the gap theory, or our pastor believes in theistic evolution. Oh, uh, we have people who believe in the day-age theory and so on. They say to me, what's your position? And I say, oh, the biblical one. What do you mean? Oh, I just take God's word as written. I don't try to add ideas from outside of Scripture. And you know what? It's very clear that God created everything in six days. It's very clear that death came after sin. It's very clear there was a global flood that covered the highest hills under the whole of heaven, if you just read Genesis as written. But see, I think one of the reasons we have uh, such diversity of views in a lot of our churches and Christian colleges is because even the majority of our academics, I believe, either don't or don't want to really understand science. When I debated Bill Nye on this very stage a few years ago, one of the first things I did was to define the terms. Science, the word science comes from the Latin scientia, which means to know. It means knowledge. And I said, you can gain knowledge by experimentation using your five senses, and you can repeat your experiments over and over again. That's what developed technology. We call that observational, or you could call it operational science. But then when it comes to knowledge about the past, when you weren't there, our origins, that's very different. Then that's called historical science. And... I believe a big problem we've got is that even many of our, our Christian academics in our colleges, Christian colleges, Bible colleges, many of our pastors really don't understand the difference between observational science and historical science. You don't go out and see the age of rocks. You have to interpret them based on assumptions about the past. But you do go out and see the rocks. There's a big difference between historical science and observational science. You know, when we did the research on Christian colleges and Bible colleges and seminaries, mainly towards the conservative bent, and we researched the presidents, vice presidents, head of science, head of Bible or religion in those colleges, one of the questions are asked, would you consider yourself to be a young earth or old earth Christian? And of course, the majority were old earth. Uh, but then when we actually singled out the religion departments or Bible departments versus the science departments in these Christian institutions, notice the religion department, 78% were old earth, whereas the science department, 35%. In other words, you're much more likely to find those believing in millions of years in the religion department or the Bible department rather than the science department. I think one of the main reasons for that is because Many in the science departments recognize this difference between observational science and historical science. You know, when you use a dating method like your uranium lead or potassium argon, and so it's based on all sorts of assumptions, and those assumptions are fallible assumptions, so you can't prove using those dating methods the age of things. In fact, there's a lot uh, in science that would contradict the idea of millions of years. But the bottom line is the only way you'd know how old the Earth is if someone was there who knows everything. Who told us? Well, there is. We have the word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, who told us in the beginning, and then he created everything in six days, and we have all that history that he's given us. We need to take him at his word.
I want to show you what's been happening in our Christian colleges and Christian institutions. And I want to use two examples in particular here because these are representative of the state of our Christian institutions in our Western world, in fact, around the whole world. And this is a pandemic we should be really, really concerned about. I know we're in the middle of a coronavirus pandemic, as they call it. People, there's a pandemic in our churches that we've been ignoring and that we need to deal with. And it's this pandemic. There's an organization called BioLogos. Now, BioLogos uh, was set up uh, funding from the John Templeton Foundation, and uh, it was set up specifically to get the church to believe in evolution of millions of years. Their mission, BioLogos invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith as we present an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. And then they list what they believe. We believe that the diversity and interrelation of all life on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. Thus, evolution is not in opposition to God, but a means by which God providentially achieves his purposes. Now, BioLogos, actually, has infiltrated so many of our Christian colleges and seminaries and Bible colleges, even many of our conservative ones. And they'll do it in a very subtle way, uh, you know, like a science series for seminaries. But it's really all about trying to get their tentacles in to get them to compromise God's word. I want to give you a specific example. Many of you are probably familiar with Wheaton College. In fact, if you go to their website, Wheaton College in Illinois, are to, are, uh, they say, as the top distinctively Christian liberal arts college in the U.S. Really? It's the top distinctively liberal arts Christian college? Well... Wheaton College, actually, this was a headline on the Biologus website, uh, released a new book of, on theories of origins. And there are a number of professors from Wheaton College who are responsible for this. Uh, the Biologus site said this, the Biologus, we're thrilled to announce the release of an important new book, Understanding Scientific Theories of Origins, Cosmology, Geology, and Biology. In a Christian perspective, this book, a textbook, was written by five Wheaton College professors, the fruit of a three-year grant they received from Biologos in 2013. That was a seven-figure amount uh, that they received to produce this new textbook, and this is the textbook right here. They want to see this textbook used in Christian colleges across the nation. Well, I'm just going to give you a few quotes from this textbook. We've read through the entire textbook. None of this is taken out of context. A Bible-first approach devalues the meaningfulness of creation revelation. A Bible-first approach. At Answers in Genesis, we are not ashamed to say we take a Bible-first approach. Only God knows everything. This is his word. All scriptures inspired by God. This is where we start. And you see, the reason they make that statement is because they're saying, you can't just take Genesis as written. You've got to listen to what man is saying about millions of years and evolution and then reinterpret it. For instance, another quote, the age of the earth now understood to be 4.55 billion years is really less a theory than it is a measurement. In other words, it's fact that the universe is billions of years old. You did not get that, or the earth is billions of years old, I should say there. You don't get that from scripture. That's man's fallible interpretation of the past. That's from man's religion of naturalism. In fact, the Bible makes it clear. You know, if you believe in millions of years, you believe those fossil layers, as the Wheaton College professors here believe, were laid down millions of years before man, then you've got death and diseases like cancer that you find in the fossil record and thorns that you find in the fossil record before man. The Bible makes it clear man's sin caused death and disease and thorns came after the curse. You can't add those two things together. We would say most of your fossil records are record of the flood. They go on in their textbook. Although some Christians have argued the fall utterly disrupted some kind of original perfection of creation. Of course, that's what we teach in Answers in Genesis. We make no apology about it. That's what the Bible teaches. Everything was very good when God created it. But now the whole creation groans, Romans 8. They say there is no evidence from either the Bible or creation making that a foregone conclusion. Really? By one man, sin of the world, and death by sin, death came upon all men. That deals with, with the human race in particular. But Romans 8 says the whole creation groans because of sin. And you see, the, the trouble is when you believe in millions of years, you've got to, you've got to say the, the death and the struggle we see today has gone on for millions of years. So God used that because you believe in millions of years 
So you can't have a fall that changes everything. And that's an incredible big stumbling block for people today, young people. Then God's responsible for death, disease, cancer. God's responsible then for the coronavirus. It's all his fault. The Bible says, no, man's responsible because we sinned against a holy God. The world we're looking at today is not the world as God made it. It's fallen from the original perfection because of our sin. The Bible makes that very clear. They go on and say, here it is enough to say the geological data to support a flood of massive proportion is lacking. Furthermore, no archaeological evidence lends to support of such a flood. There are billions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth. Why do they not want to believe in a global flood? Because if you believe most of your fossil record came from a global flood, then you've destroyed the, the, their supposed evidence for millions of years. And they believe in millions of years, so they can't have a global flood. So they reject a global flood, which means you're rejecting the word of God in Genesis. Well, what about this one? Humans are hominoid primates, apes. Hominoid primates are apes. They actually state this in their textbook. Humans are apes in the hominid tribe with cognitive abilities that exceed those of all other primates, evidenced by our ever-advancing technology, cultural innovations, and adaptability to different environments. You're just an ape, you're just a bit more intelligent than the apes. I mean, go down to the local zoo and you'll have a look. You're pretty similar. I mean, they're kept behind a big fence. You're not allowed to go in there because they'll attack you and could kill you, and they can't talk to you, and... They, they, they don't use tools to invent tools, and they don't do wonderful paintings, and, and uh, they don't have a language, but you're, you're very similar to them. No, the Bible says we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all one race. We're made in the image of God. No animal is. We're different to the animals. We're not basically apes. Apes are animals. Humans are humans. The Bible makes it very clear. Well, then you get people like William Lane Craig, who's said to be a great apologist of our age, research prof of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. But, you know, here's a sad thing with these people. Listen to what he says. How old is the world? Best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace, because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's 6,500 years old. Um, you, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. In other words, I go with what he says science. He means man's historical science, man's fallible beliefs based on naturalism. I go with what man says. I don't go with what the Bible says. That's the undermining of the authority of Scripture that has permeated our colleges, permeated our churches, and we wonder why we've got a problem losing the coming generations in our churches. People, we need to repent before a holy God as, as God's people. Those colleges, Christian colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries, those professors who compromise God's word in Genesis, those pastors, Christian leaders, they need to get on their knees and repent before a holy God because we have dared to take man's pagan religion and reinterpret the word of God. And then we say, oh, what's happened to the church? Oh, what's happened to the younger generations? You know, here is a, a, another one that we have here. Uh, and this is from Dr. John Collins uh, from uh, St. Louis. And when we look at this here, uh, Dr. Collins is actually professor of Old Testament at Covenant Theology Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. It's known as the Denominational Seminary for the PCA, and he's one of the ESV translators, actually. Uh, let's see what he says about the flood, whether it's local or global. What's your perspective on the flood? Do you think it was global or local? Mm -hmm. um well, I, I think from the perspective of the words in Genesis uh, 6 through 9, you can't tell. Um, the, the, uh, ex, the, it, I mean, it, uh, at first reading, it looks like it was global, doesn't it? Because it's all the earth and the high mountains are covered and so forth. Oh, it, it, you know, you can't tell. But at first reading, it does seem to be global. Of course it's global. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering 15 cubits deep. You know why he doesn't want to believe what it says? Because he admits, if you just take it as written, it seems to say global flood, because he believes in millions of years. 
accommodating to the pagan religion of our age. And you know, here's another example from the, from the same Dr. Collins. Uh, and, and when talking about how many people survived the flood, you tell me, how many people survived the flood? Right? According to the Bible, it was how many? Eight. Right? Well, let's see what Dr. Collins says. Okay. And do you think that the flood was universal or um, in terms of wiping out all of humanity or, or not? Um, I, I, I would like to think so. Um, it's, there, there's places where you get a little bit uncertain. Um, how long ago uh, did it take place Be becomes a, a question. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think there's any answer to that. Um, but um, you, you do find hints in some uh, uh, ancient expositors the, uh, of the possibility that others besides Noah and his family survived the flood. Uh, Josephus, for example, talks about that. I, I, I can't believe this. I mean, his books being used in seminaries in, in different parts of the nation, it, influencing these students and pastors and others, and he would dare point to Josephus to overrule the word of God when Josephus was a historian, but Josephus' works are not the inspired word of God. Now, in Josephus, it does say, oh, there is a great mountain in Armenia called Barris, upon which is reported that many uh, who fled at the time of the deluge were saved. Wait a minute, what does the Bible say? It says all mankind, other than those on the ark, were killed during the flood. And in fact, in Genesis 9, we read the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And these three were the sons of Noah. From these, the people of the whole world were dispersed. And then in 1 Peter 3, we read, because they formerly did not obey when God's patient waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. The Bible makes it clear. Only eight people survived the flood. And not only that, all the people of the world today go back to the three sons uh, of Noah. All mankind except eight uh, sub, uh, were killed during the flood. So what on earth is Dr. John Collins doing? There's hours of video on the internet you can watch of him. We should be falling on our knees and weeping before a holy God because these people, I'm not attacking their Christianity, I'm not saying they're not Christians, I'm not saying that at all, but they are undermining the authority of the word of God and have actually had an incredible negative impact on the church in coming generations. They have a lot to answer for. They need to stand before God and tell him what he didn't say in his word. That's what they need to do. Well, they will one day. You know, I like what Martin Luther said. The days of creation were ordinary days in length. We must understand that these days were actual days contrary to the opinions of the Holy Fathers. Whenever we observe that the opinions of the Fathers disagree with Scripture, we reverently bear with them and acknowledge them to be our elders. Nevertheless, we do not depart from the authority of Scripture for their sake. That's what we should be saying. People in our churches need to stand up against these academics in our Christian colleges and Bible colleges. They need to stop giving them funds. They need to stop sending students to these colleges until they take a stand on the Word of God in Genesis like they should. Now, I said I would spend most of the time on the authority issue. I just mentioned, number two, I said it's an indirect salvation issue. I've already actually covered that. Uh, we did that in the book Already Gone, by the way. We looked at research, why young people leaving the church and very few returning. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that they were led to believe that you couldn't really trust the book of Genesis and that to them science had undermined the authority of the word of God and they weren't taught uh, apologetics, weren't taught to defend their faith. In other words, that compromise was an incredible stumbling block to them and led them on uh, a, a slippery slide of doubt to unbelief through Scripture. And you can look today, church attendance from the greatest generation, 56%, down to the millennials of 18%, and Generation Z less than that. We have a major problem in our church. And the book Ready to Return, well, when we look at the millennials that are left in our churches, do you realize that only 40% say they're born again, but 65% believe if you're a good person, uh, you'll, you'll go to heaven. And one of the, when you do the research and read the book, you'll find one of the big issues that affected them was the issue of millions of years. And then, as we look at all that, it's a gospel issue. You know why it's a gospel issue? 
It's a gospel issue for this reason, because I already went through the whole issue of death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering. When you believe in millions of years, you're saying God's responsible for death, for diseases like cancer, for the coronavirus causing uh, deaths and so on. God's responsible, but the Bible says, no, our sin brought death into the world and, and disease and, and suffering. It's our sin that's responsible. And people, those who believe in millions of years, and that's the majority of our Christian leaders, unfortunately, it's an attack on the character of God. Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb. Jesus had compassion on people who were sick and healed them. One day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where we no more death and all his tears wiped away, no more disease or suffering. A restoration like it was originally. But if you believe in millions of years, you're going to go to heaven and have all this death and suffering and all these tears and cancer because that's how God did it and he calls all that very good. How dare these people attack the character of God like this? And if there was millions of years of shedding of blood before Adam sinned, what on earth has a shedding of blood got to do with the remission of sins? Without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Hey, what do you believe about the days of creation? It's an authority issue. It's an indirect salvation issue. It is a, a gospel issue. And before we finish here, I just want to mention to you that if you want this in much more detail, it's in the book Six Days, and I have a lot of those quotes from people who compromise uh, there in the book uh, Six Days. Got a lot of other quotes. Uh, don't have those Wheaton College ones in there yet because they're very modern uh, quotes. Just want to mention to you, while the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter are closed to the public, uh, we have free shipping on orders of $50 or more. We'll just free ship to you. I have a video presentation on the six days in this set here. The Foundations Curriculum Kit is really an introductory apologetics program. 12 30-minute videos with a study guide to go with them. Hey, while you're sitting at home and on shutdown, why not get the Foundations Curriculum Kit? Uh, it'll be free shipping because it's over $50, and you can do that as a series with your family. Actually, teenager and adults, but I find 10-year-old and upwards really love it too. And then we have a super COVID-19 special for you. Hundreds of people have now taken advantage of this. We have what's called Creation Apologetics Masterclass. It's six self-paced courses that normally we have sold in the past for $49 each. They're, they're like online courses. Uh, there's the Fundamentals of Creation Apologetics, there's one on creation, apologetics and science, apologetics in the Bible, apologetics in biology, apologetics in geology, apologetics in astronomy. Because, we, because of all the situation that's happening, and we know many of you have been suffering financially, hey, instead of $49 each, we let you have them for $19 for the entire six. And you can go online uh, to get the information for that. You can just go answerseducation.com, answerseducation.com, or go to answersandgenesis.org and just do a search for our online uh, courses there, the Masterclass Creation Apologetics course. Uh, my book, The Lie, is really the textbook other than the Bible. The Bible is the textbook of our ministry. That's the textbook of our ministry. But these seven books, I would call the seven core resources, the five answers books, the four answers books, and the flood of evidence, 160 of the most asked questions people ask today that really are questions to attack and undermine the authority of God's word beginning in Genesis with detailed answers. My book, The Lie, which deals with the whole importance, foundational importance of the book of Genesis, and then Gospel Reset, how to evangelize a culture that has changed foundation. And the answers books for kids, young kids have the same questions. And we deal with the six-day issue on the age of the earth in these and dinosaurs and so on. And then uh, we encourage you to be using in your churches, in your Sunday schools. A lot of homeschoolers use this for a homeschool Bible curriculum. We have a four-year Answers Bible curriculum, all synchronized lessons, lessons across six age groups, and it deals with biblical authority, chronological apologetics. There is no other curriculum in the world, Bible curriculum, like this. And churches are telling us over 10,000 churches are now using it, that it's revolutionizing their churches. And you can get it all in digital format uh, as well. And one last thing, 
Well, the majority of our staff right now have been furloughed or you know, they're, they're temporarily uh, in a laid off position uh, because we've had to close down the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum. And uh, there's a number of uh, staff that are unpaid and others that are in reduced salaries to keep everything going uh, here at Ministry. And we're producing a lot of material, still impacting material through Facebook uh, Live and other live programs and all sorts of other content. But if you want to help uh, the ministry, I encourage you to go to answersandgenesis.org to our donate page. You'll see it right on the top on the front page. You can go slash donate right there. Uh, so many people have been helping us so that we can survive through this current situation. And we just trust the Lord for that because it's his ministry and he's in control. Well, thanks for watching today. And uh, I hope uh, you saw our heart, and my heart, for what this ministry is all about, the authority of the word of God and the saving gospel. That's the message.